Hello and welcome to a video on the development of the heart. So as you'd remember, the heart and the circulatory system, they start to develop in the third week when uh, the developing embryo cannot um, depend entirely on diffusion, right? And this circulatory system is mainly going to be derived from mesoderm. And within the third week, cells within the epiblast, they're going to migrate uh, through the primitive streak and they're going to reside in your splanchnic mesoderm, which is going to be the visceral lateral plate mesoderm. And those cells are going to be the primary heart field cells. The primary heart field cells will give rise to the atria. They also give rise to the left ventricle and they'll also give rise to part of your right ventricle. And of course, if it's primary, there's also going to be appearance of a secondary. The secondary heart field cells will give rise to part of the right ventricle. They will give the outflow tracts as well as the caudal parts of your atria. Right? And these mesodermal cells are going to be induced by the underlying pharyngeal endoderm for them to form or for them to fuse and form the endothelial tubes. You have two endothelial tubes that are going to form on either side of a dorsal iota. And those endothelial tubes, they're going to fuse due to the cephalocordal and lateral folding to form a single heart tube. The single heart tube will be patterned um, using retinoic acid concentrations that are different with a gradient into the caudal sinus venosus. Then you have a primitive atrium, you have a primitive ventricle, then you have the bulbous cordis. Right. And the developing heart starts to beat in around day 22, which is going to be the beginning of the fourth week. And like I say, the heart mainly forms from splanchnic mesoderm. We're also going to have contributions from the neural crest cells, which are going to form the endocardial cushions, which develop between the primitive atria and the primitive ventricle, as well as the spiral septum, which is going to form within the trangus atriosus. Right. And as a general rule, heart looping is going to occur between day 22 or 23 up until day 28, and it takes approximately uh, five days to occur. Normal heart looping will be, will be referred to as level cardia, whereas abnormal heart looping will result in dextrocardia. Right. Then cardiac acceptation basically takes 10 days. It's going to be from day 27 to, to day 37. Right. And you'd also remember that the fetal circulation is quite different from that in the adult circulation that we're used to in our gross anatomy. We're going to have three functional shunts that are operational in utero. There's going to be the foramen of valley, which is going to shunt blood from the right atrium to the left. Then there's the ductus atriosus, which shunts blood from the pulmonary trunk to the, to the iota. Then you have the ductus venosus, which bypasses the liver, because remember the metabolic functions in a developing embryo will actually uh, be performed by the mother, right? So in the middle there is um, the heart tube. If you look at the sinus venosus, it has two horns, a right horn and a left horn. Each horn initially will receive three veins. There's the common cardinal veins, which carry poorly oxygenated blood from the rest of the body. Then there's the umbilical veins, which bring oxygenated blood from the chorion or the placenta. Then there is the vitelline veins, which carry poorly deoxygenated blood again, coming from the yolk sac, right? So you have three veins for the left horn and the right horn, right? The vitelline veins are, in an adult, they're going to form part of the portal circulation uh, and part of the liver sinusoids. The umbilical veins, you'd remember, you see the ligamentum teres. Then the common cardinal veins, you'd remember that they're joined by an anterior cardinal and a posterior cardinal veins. The anterior cardinal veins will shunt blood to, to the right, which you're going to see in an adult as the left brachiocephalic vein crossing to join the right one to form your superior vena cava. Right. Then the posterior cardinal veins mainly develop as the veins of the developing mesonephros, which you're going to see as one of the three kidneys that form and, and, and an embryo. And they're also going to regress with, um, with the regression of those veins, but they're going to form the common iliac veins as well as the roots of the azygous veins. Right. 
So during the fifth week of development, you have regression of the right umbilical vein and the left vitelline vein, such that you're only left with one umbilical vein after the fifth week, which is going to be the left uh, umbilical vein. Then in the 10th week of development, you also have regression of the left common cardinal veins, right? And if you look at this heart tube, the left horn of the sinus venosus will basically regress and it will give us the coronary sinus, which is the largest vein draining the heart. And it also gives us the left oblique vein. And the right horn of the sinus venosus will basically give the smooth part of the right atrium. And during embryonic development, development of the conducting system of the heart precedes that of the nervous uh, system that is going to connect to the heart, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. The primitive atrium will initially act as the primordia for the conducting system, after which the function is assumed by the right wall of the sinus venosus. The sinus venosus will form the SA node in the fifth week. And remember, the SA node is then going to become the pacemaker of the heart. Then the primitive atrium will form the rough part of the left atrium and the rough part of the, the right atrium. Then the primitive ventricle basically can be called a primitive left ventricle. It forms the trabeculated part of the left ventricle as well as part of the right. right. Then if you look at your distal end of the heart, that is going to be the bulbous cordis. Your bulbous cordis will be divided into three. So you have a proximal third, a medial third, and a distal third. The proximal third is going to be the conus atriosus. It gives rise to the rough part of the right ventricle. Then the medial third is going to be the conus cordis. It gives rise to the outflow tracts of the ventricles. That is going to be the infundibulum for the right and the aortic vestibule for the left. Then the distal third will be the trangus atriosus. The trangus atriosus will give rise to the ascending aorta as well as the pulmonary trunk. Of importance, the distal ends of that trangus atriosus will form what are known as aortic sex. The aortic sex are going to be the arteries of the pharyngeal axe. When you look at the development of the pharyngeal axe and the head and neck, right? So you're going to have the first aortic sac, the second, the third, then you have the fourth, and um, you also expect to have the sixth, right? The first aortic sac will give rise to the maxillary arteries, which in an adult you expect to be one of the terminal branches of the external carotid in the substance of the parotid gland. Then the second aortic arc will give the hyoid artery and the stapedial arteries. The names are self-explanatory. The hyoid arteries will follow the hyoid bone, which is one of the bones on the ventral aspect of the neck. Then the stapedial arteries will follow the steps, which is the smallest bone in the body located in the middle ear. Then the third aortic sac will give rise to the common carotids and the first parts of the internal carotid. Whereas if you look at the fourth, you divide them into a left and a right. That of the left will give the arc of the aorta that is between the common carotid and the subclavians on the left. Then that on the right will give you the right subclavian arteries. And if you look at the sixth, they give rise to the pulmonary arteries, the left and the right. And that on the left will also give rise to your ductus atriosus, which we said was going to be one of the three functional shunts in utero. So if you then look at an adult, you remember the left. Uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve will actually walk around the ductus atriosus, and that left recurrent laryngeal nerve it's going to walk around the ligamentum atriosus in an adult. But for the right one, the part on the right that is supposed to form another ductus atriosus will regress such that the right recurrent laryngeal nerve will then walk on the fourth aortic sac on the right, which I just said is going to give the subclavian arteries. So if you then look at the right recurrent laryngeal nerve, it, it doesn't go down into the neck. It actually hooks around the subclavian vessels, right? So a recap of that tube, the left horn will regress and give you the coronary sinus and the left oblique vein. 
the right one will form the smooth part of the right atrium. And the primitive atrium will form the rough parts of both the atria, the left and the right. The primitive ventricle will give rise to the rough part of the left ventricle. Then the truncus atriosus, like we said, it's going to be divided into those three parts. The proximal third will give the rough part of the right ventricle mainly. The middle third, the corners cordis, will give the outflow tracts of the ventricles. And the distal third, the truncus atriosus, will give rise to the iota and the pulmonary trunk, particularly the ascending iota. Then the distal most part of the truncus atriosus will give us the aortic sex. If you have noticed, we haven't mentioned the smooth part of the right atrium. Of, oh, we haven't mentioned the smooth part of the left atrium. For the right, we said it's, um, it's coming from your right one of the sinus venosus. For the left, the smooth part of the left atrium originates from incorporation of the pulmonary veins into your developing uh, left atrium. That's where the smooth part actually comes from. And if those pulmonary veins decide to open on the opposite side, which is going to be the right, you get something that is known as TAPV atom, which is total anomalous pulmonary venous return, which is going to be one of the causes of early cyanosis in a neonate together with tricuspid atresia, tetralogy of fallo, you also have trangus atriosus, where you fail to divide the trangus atriosus totally. Then uh, you then also have septation of the heart, which I said occurs normally between day 27 and day 37. Within the atria, you have appearance of a primary septum, also known as the septum primum. The septum primum will grow towards the endocardial cushion, which I said was going to develop between the primordia of the atria and the ventricle, but it doesn't grow to overlap it. And it leaves a, a very small gap, which is going to be the primary ostium or the primary opening, primary foramen, whichever way you want to take it. Then over time, that septum primum will close the gap and another secondary opening will, um, occurs within its upper part, which is going to be the ostium secundum or the secondary foramen. At the same time, you have appearance of a secondary septum or a septum secundum, which just grows to overlap the ostium secundum. Hence, we end up with a foramen of valley, which is somehow an indirect communication between the two atria. And remember, I say that is going to be one of the functional shunts in utero, shunting blood from the right to the left. In adult heart, we'll see that as the fossa ovalis. Then for development of the ventricular septum, you have proliferation of tissue at the base of the ventricle, which grows towards the endocardial cushion, and that mainly forms the muscular part. Some of the cells on the right side of the endocardial cushion, they'll start to proliferate and close the gap, and they form the membranous part of your ventricular septum. Defects are more likely going to occur within the membranous part of this uh, muscular, of this um, interventricular septum rather, right? Then ventricular septal defects are the most common uh, congenital heart disease occurring in isolation, right? And if they occur in the membranous part, they actually have um, a high risk uh, of, the, of fatality, right? Then there's something known as tetralogy of Fallo. So within the truncus atriosus, there's appearance of a spiral septum, which spirals in such a way that if you look at the iota, it ends up on the right, but, uh, then the pulmonary trunk ends up on the, on the left. And due to the spiraling nature of that uh, septum, it appears as if the iota is exiting the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk is exiting uh, the left, but that's not the case. Right. And if you have a defect in the neural crystals that are supposed to form that spiral septum as well as the endocardial cushion, you end up with something known as tetralogy of fallo, where you're going to have overriding iota, you have a pulmonary stenosis, then you have interventricular septal defects within the membranous part. And as a result, blood moves from high pressure to low pressure, which is from the left ventricle to the right ventricle resulting in right ventricular hypertrophy. But the end result is there will also be a reversal of flow uh, to the left if you end up having something known as Ames and Right. 
Then other defects, you also have a pattern ductus atriosus, which leads to pulmonary hypertension. If you fail to uh, close the ductus atriosus, which then results in high pressure blood moving from the aorta into the pulmonary circulation. Right. Then we also talked about sinistral folding, which is left folding of the heart, which results in dextrocardia as opposed to the normal heart folding, which we said was going to be levocardia, right? That's just about it. Thank you for watching.